All right, welcome to the Rojas Report. I am here with Adam Kehoe, and uh, no relation to Donald Kehoe. Um, I've been working with, uh, you know, writing about Donald Kehoe for so many years that I misspelt your name in a few places, so I apologize for that. I appreciate that. That's a, an increasingly common question in my life right now. Oh, about Donald Kehoe? I bet. So we're no relation, different spelling. A uh, fairly common Irish surname, but no, or no relation, at least as far as. I know. <laughs> yeah, I did have a few people asking when I did post this, but uh, of course, you have your PhD in information science, uh, as you've got on. I kind of stole your Twitter uh, bio there. You have an interest in AI, data science, and defense policy issues. The latter of which I think has probably been your inspiration for getting involved with all of the interesting policy issues that arise when they begin to ask uh, for UAP reports from the different intelligence agencies. But uh, I would like to hear from you uh, yourself, you know, what is it? When did you first kind of decide to start to uh, look into this and, and blog about it? Sure. Well, I think like a lot of people with an interest in science, I mean, it's always been in at least my peripheral vision growing up, you know, stories of UFOs and things like that. Um, you know, I never had a sighting or anything like that myself. Um, and I think like many people around 2017, the issue really started coming up on my radar, um, particularly as we got more and more details uh, about the Nimitz case. Um, so the more I learned about Nimitz, the more it seemed to me that, you know, there's really four broad categories of explanation. And so often, you know, people get lost in the debate about what it was, right, what it is that you, we sort of forget to take a step back and think about, well, what are the implications for all of the different alternatives? What would it, what would be true if it turned out to be, you know, one thing or another? Um, and so that, that really concerned me greatly. And, um, you know, I think my, my first piece, which kind of laid out what the implications are in each one of these scenarios was kind of my entrance into this topic. And then from there, as I've learned more, it's just become more and more interesting and fascinating, really. I mean, I think the interesting thing from a defense perspective about UFOs is that they involve the unknown, right? They're on the very edge of, of what we understand, what we can easily identify. I mean, by definition, we can't identify them. Uh, and so a lot of interesting things fall into that category. Um, so that's that's what, you know, sort of got my, my interest. Mm -hmm. And I do want to, I'm going to share the screen here and bring up your website. I just want to show it to everybody. Uh, where you have your articles, because I highly, highly recommend that people go there. Just blog .com, uh strategic doubt, and they can see all of your articles, all of which I've found really fascinating. Um, and we'll get into these topics. I guess, Great. first off, you know, it was always, it was interesting to me, and I, and I, Phil, this is a real kind of strange policy issue. When I first started getting involved with this, or at least I decided be, to become uh, a field investigator for, for the Mutual UFO Network, just to kind of speak firsthand with witnesses who saw things. At this time, you know, I was just out of journalism school uh, or, you know, fairly fresh out of it. And uh, I was a bit skeptical about the whole topic. So I wanted to see, you know, how convinced these, these witnesses and uh, how credible are they? Uh, the very first one I had was a uh, someone who just came from Iraq. He was working security at a bank. Uh, he had gone outside, seen this weird object uh, near Lookout Mountain in Colorado outside of Denver. And there were a lot of commercial airplanes that go over. I called the FAA. I called, uh, you know, a lot of different organizations. And essentially, they told me they're not interested. The FAA in particular told me to talk to Bigelow. Uh, or, you know, this other small UFO research organization uh, that is manned by one person who would just essentially log it uh, in Washington, New Fork, for those of you who know that group. And uh, it was weird that, you know, here's a guy, ex-military, he's used to reporting things that are of, uh, you know, you would think would be uh, something that could pose a danger, uh, in, this in this case, the commercial airliner. And, uh, and that was his concern, but they didn't even want to take the report. It seemed almost, um, 
you know, medieval or something that it that because of the taboo of UFOs, they were ignoring a potentially important, you know, piece of intelligence that could, uh, you know, it could have been civilian technology that was posing a threat. That seems like a r weird policy stance, don't you think? I do. I do. And I, I think that a, a lot of people have an impression that the government is this monolithic, um, super powerful thing that is omniscient and can track absolutely everything and is on top of every kind of report that might be coming out. Um, but I, I don't think that's actually the case. Um, you know, the government is this incredibly complicated thing with many different aspects. It do doesn't often agree with itself. Um, and things certainly do fall in the cracks. And I, I think that you know, these sorts of unknown aerial sightings are very much one of those things that um, not many are particularly incentivized to look at closely. And, you know, the story you just told, I think, is is a great example, um, you know, of that playing out. And that's one of the things I've written about recently is that, you know, as we go into the next 10, 20, 30 years, we can expect that the sky is going to become a busier, more complex space. There are going to be more unusual things as drone technology pr proliferates. So having this kind of stilted cultural language to describe, you know, strange sightings, it, it's always been dangerous, but it's, it's becoming more acutely dangerous that, that things don't get reported or when they do, um, when they are reported, they aren't taken seriously. Um, I think it's a real problem um, and something that needs to be examined. Mm -hmm. And it seems that, you know, one way to kind of deal with the taboo is the adoption of this term UAP. Uh, I know Nick Pope likes to say that the uh, Ministry of Defense first adopted that, but I think it actually might have been uh, New Fork, a different uh, organization headed by scientists that looked at uh, commercial airline. They, they lay claim to the term also, but it was a term used early on to move away from the term UFO, which comes with all this baggage and is typically used to mean alien spacecraft. But it almost seems as though... Uh, and I've always thought that that this this evolution to this new term wouldn't work because you kind of need to rebrand the concept in that that baggage seems to have followed them because we still get, you know, in the daily conversations in the media, especially, you know, UAP now meaning little gray men. Right. I think that's exactly right. I think substituting one word or term for another doesn't solve the root problem. Um, which is a kind of maturity problem, um, to be able to look at this head on, to discuss it. Uh, and, you know, something I argued recently is that almost assuredly, you know, if you look at the pile of unknown cases, right, there's, there's a fair amount of misidentification in there. I don't think that's particularly controversial to say. There's probably some um, secret black budget programs in there, uh, you know, particularly when people are seeing things like some of the black triangles, you know, that can be any number of different aircraft. Um, and then, you know, there's likely some foreign adversary in there as well, um, particularly in terms of um, some of the drone incursions that have been reported. There's, I think, at least some reason to think some of that is uh, foreign intelligence services probing and th things of that nature. And then finally, yes, there are some cases that are really strange. They're just, there's no other way to characterize them, that they're extremely strange, they're hard to resolve. Um, and so what? You know, we've got to look at that, right? Um, like we look at it, any other issue. Um, mm -hmm. And I think until we kind of have a, a cultural reckoning with that, it's going to be hard to escape, you know, the kind of giggle factor or um, I think even more pernicious, just replacing every time we encounter UAP and then doing the mental substitution of that means alien or, you know, that means X or Y. So a little bit less of the debate about what is, you know, each particular thing, but about, you know, all of these things kind of together and, and what they mean collectively. Mm hmm. Right. And I think that's where uh, I don't know if maybe the DRD is hesitant to join in on this conversation, but they're going to have to that they feel it, at least I read in their messages uh, or messaging that they kind of feel that, uh, well, we're the military. Of course, we consider UAPs uh, potentially or largely to be drones or other man-made aircraft. But I don't think the public gets that. And uh I don't think that the, what I've kind of been advocating for is that we all have to educate the public and make sure they understand unidentified. The U in UFO or UAP means unidentified means we don't know. We're looking into it because we just don't know. And that seems to be a campaign um, kind of to your point 
that that you could mean these four different uh, categories of, of uh, I, not just one. And the, and the DOD is in, uh, or any military in, in the world, is in a sensitive, delicate position in handling these things because none of them are particularly great um, from, from their perspective. So if you're talking about a misidentification, there's some potential for embarrassment there, and there's also some potential for revealing um, vulnerabilities, um, things that don't sort of work well in, in current sensor systems. So admitting that you, you, know, you couldn't identify something is, is a bit problematic. And then obviously in the other categories, it comes to either revealing your own capabilities, which you don't want to do, or revealing what you know about others' capabilities um, mm -hmm. in terms of foreign adversary. And then when we get to the final category, which I think is, you know, the most difficult, it's just so strange. It's just so far outside the realm of what they're accustomed to dealing with that, you know, I'm not sure that there's a kind of vocabulary to deal with those cases. And, and also there's, you're always reserving doubt of what if this is some sort of breakthrough project of some kind. Um, I can understand and actually even sympathize a little bit with a reluctance to, to deal with that. But nonetheless, we, we have to be able to have the conversation because the cost of not having the conversation is the stigma. Uh, which leads to uh, missed intelligence opportunities and, and, and all sorts of different things. Uh, and that's assuming mm -hmm. that this is all for the egg, <laughs> which if it's not, then there's a whole other kettle of fish. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's funny because as you say these things, uh, dozens of questions come to mind because really I think uh, tackling each of those categories, you know, uh, are very big topics. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, reading uh, just this week or just last night about, the Mueller report and the counterintelligence report that uh, the the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, Lou called it sissy in my last interview, the SSCI, you know, uh, in that the, the manner in which counterintelligence works, which is uh, very heavy towards what you were mentioning, you don't want to tip your hand. You don't want to tip your hand as that you recognize that this might be foreign technology. You don't want them to know what we know that they have, nor do you want to tip your hand towards technologies we have because we don't want them to know what we have, which kind of, um, you know, it, it caused difficulty with the, with the Mueller, uh, you know, the investigation into the Russian interfer interference in the election. But of course, it also uh, pertains to this topic because it puts them really in a difficult situation in that they really, it seems to me, and I've always felt that this would be a difficult uh, thing for Blue Book 2, you know, if it ever came out. How do they categorize? Because they really can't categorize. They can't definitively say, oh, we figured out this was just ours. Um, if that's the case, you know, it's something that we're working on, then they're tipping their hand towards information that's classified that we really don't want out there. Right. Absolutely. It is, it is an incredibly, um, like I said, delicate position to be in and they have a lot to, to weigh in making those kinds of decisions. You know, it's interesting hearing people talk about blue book. Um, I actually think that with the Senate Intel developments, it might be better to look at the, the post 9-11 report or even the post-Iraq war invasion intelligence review as mm -hmm. a model for that. And one of the reasons I say that is Chris Mellon, um, obviously, in that, you know, I, I hate to characterize anyone's career, but 9-11 but in Iraq were really quite central for him. And as kind of the architect of that, that policy moment, I think the idea is that you do a one-time, relatively short, comprehensive review that's primarily designed for the government. So we know from earlier versions um, of the language, the kind of draft language, that originally he envisioned a process that may or may not be fully public. Um, there might be a purely you know, classified component of it. Uh, with the intent of you map out all these issues, you find the, the gaps and the vulnerabilities, and you do it in the legislative branch exactly so that you can then go and make new law or, or reset priorities or do whatever you need to do to fix the problem. And yes, you let the public know about it as a matter of public confidence, but the primary design is to make sure that the intelligence system is, is working properly. Um, you know, and I think someone who's, you know, his life experience has shown him the intelligence system not working properly, um, you know, in, in two really conspicuous moments in history. So um, to me, I think that is the kind of DNA um, of the Senate Intel report. Um, and mm -hmm. I think, it, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes in ufology where 
there's a tendency to just look at the UFO cases and we've got what 70 years of them, but it's important to take a step back and look at the wider world because, you know, all of this has a context that goes, you know, far, far beyond UFOs. It has everything to do with our political moment, our geostrategic moment, you know, all of these things all at once. Mm -hmm. I think you make a lot of very, very good points. And I want to get back to, to the point you just made, but there is a question. Um, someone says, and, and I think you've demonstrated uh, quite a bit of this already, but uh, they ask, uh, Silly Humans asks, how does Adam apply his expertise to the field and what have his recent articles been about and why? Um, well, that's, yeah. that's a, uh, it's, it's a really good question and it's going to be hard to answer very concisely. I'd recommend having, right. having a look at the site. So in a weird way, uh, you could read my first article on there and my last article on there and it'd be a good look. And so most of what I do right now is analysis. So I take the, the data and, uh, developments that are coming out and I try to place them in context, right? So I try to connect them to um other bits of history other bits of policy and politics um and to kind of try to show some of the workings of government and the kinds of questions that um you know that come up and but you've given me actually a really nice opportunity to talk about ho hopefully what I, I what i'm planning to do more of in the future so um, i'm actually working with uh tim mcmillan who's been a guest i'm i'm sure at least a couple of times here um to to partner on some stories where we kind of combine his really incredible investigative skill uh, with some data science projects. Um, so there are quite a few places where there is uh, data out there that can be examined and, and aviation and so on. Uh, and so we're working together to hopefully not, you know, at least from my part, just analyze news, but, but hopefully eventually to make some um, down the road. Now, I, you know, I, uh... Getting back into your expertise, which I think that you've demonstrated in that observation of policy and how policy is made and how particular players uh, had fit into that historically, uh, in particular, Chris Mellon, is a really good point in that uh, it is a similar situation in that we had an, a major you know, issue that happened that demonstrated we had intelligence gathering problems, um, which is kind of what they're facing now in that, uh, at least in Chris Mellon's eyes, and, and I wouldn't believe he's alone in this, but uh, who knows what the people who actually do these jobs day by day feel, but that this is, represents another intelligence gathering problem. And certainly that's the way that it was framed by the uh, SSCI, I think, uh, when they wrote their request that, you know, there's, there's disjointed, there's no central location where this material is uh, all captured and analyzed to to kind of get a, a sense of the situation, um, which is what they've requested and what hopefully will happen. And it seems to be happening. Um, but in that sense, you know, we also have the a tip that it existed, you know, the program, uh, advanced aerospace threat identification program that Luis Elizondo was a part of, um, and potentially a tip being, you know, event continuing on as this UAP task force. Either way, we now have this UAP task force, apparently, at least since June. That was the first time they kind of referred to it that I'm aware of uh, to Roger Glassell, uh, a researcher. And then, you know, we have this recent essentially press release saying that, yeah, we did establish this officially on August 4th uh, and it exists in that sense. Then um, do you feel that perhaps the UAP task force is more of a tool to create this report or something that will continue on or potentially uh, create a report and then it'll be determined whether or not they continue on or role they play? That's an excellent question and, and one I, I can't really answer. I mean, my suspicion based on what we know so far is that it's largely a continuation, a continuity of, of previous efforts. Um, I think that um, Elizondo and Mellon and TTSA have, have, have played a successful role as a forcing function to essentially say, this is under-resourced, uh, it needs to be taken more seriously. Um, so I think that that already seemed to have been happening. I mean, only, only insiders would know for sure. And then certainly the the Senate Intel developments just puts an exclamation point on on all of that because it does create a responsibility to eventually um, have this report. I don't think that the current effort is designed solely to produce the report. 
um, you know, particularly because the the language, the Senate language references um, some precursor of, of whatever this effort was. So I think that there was an awareness that it, that it existed, was doing some work. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, um, again, you know, when, whenever you see references to things like strategic surprise, like in policy terms, this is like a primal scream, right? This is really serious, deep national security stuff. So um, I, I think that there's um, a seriousness now, uh, you know, in attending to this. Mm -hmm. Now that you've kind of dipped your toes in the UFO Twitter world and you've kind <laughs> of seen what goes on in uh, kind of the UFO community, uh, it's there seems to be a major disconnect to the and, and you're kind of highlighting that and it really hasn't been voiced in that Chris Mellon, I guess, has, has somewhat gone there. But that, you know, when you're talking about strategic, you know, blind spots, uh, Chris Mellon is bringing up issues that are gaps in our real world current government that could be problems that. In, you know, like the intelligence committee needs to be aware of the committee he worked for, you know, in the past that he's familiar with. Uh, whereas the UFO community is kind of looking at this. Oh, finally, we're going to learn about Roswell and all these other things. And they seem to not really get it with those parts. So even Mellon had said uh, when he recommended this, this, this report or this, you know, attempt to get more information about UAPs. He suggested it be classified, and it would likely need to remain classified for reasons we outlined earlier, most likely, um, which is kind of, you know, uh, the UFO community wants, of course, more transparency. They don't want this to remain classified. So it does seem like completely different goals and ideas of what will be happening or what this major goal is. Um, and uh, that seems to cause a lot of problems and misinterpretation not just with the UFO community, but the media who seems to be confused about that as well. Yeah, and it should really be an issue for the scientific community as well. So I, I think one of the things that concerned me early on is that the understandable security issues and secrecy issues surrounding this means that a very small group works on it. Um, and generally science, particularly modern science, doesn't thrive in those conditions. You need large teams, you need you know, multiple perspectives on a particular problem. So particularly for those really, really hard problems, you know, the ones that, as far as we know, have gone unsolved for what, 15, 16 years, you're just not going to solve those with, you know, four people or, or whatever it may be. Um, you're going to need a, a, a wider perspective. And, and to be sure, you know, the DOD has a lot of scientific power and technical power. There's no doubting that. But at the same time, if you have a hard enough problem, you know, you need more eyes. So I think that there, there's a need for transparency, actually. I do agree with parts of the UFO community quite strongly about that, because without at least some transparency, without at least some you know, responsible production of data, if it can be done, it's just not going to move forward from a, from a scientific perspective. And if it doesn't move forward, you know, I've, I've said this before, but 15 years is a long time to be surprised, right, if we're talking about strategic surprise. Um, that that in of itself is alarming that, that something so significant has gone, you know, so long um, unsolved. So mm -hmm. there is some overlap. I think, you know, to, to those that uh, that want to throw open the doors or, or in many cases, they may be convinced that there's a particular solution and they, they think there's a particular secret that's that's actively being held. Well, I mean, I don't know. Right. Uh, may, maybe. Uh, but. Um, you know, I think it keeps it, it's worth bearing in mind that there are, are a lot of things to deal with this issue. And there's a lot of reasons why it may sometimes have to proceed a bit more cautiously than, than people would like. Right. And, you know, I think that uh, people get upset, at least in the UFO community, when the, the idea of drones is brought up or UAS is un, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, but that actually seems to be maybe one of the major issues that this organization's you know, jumping leaps and bounds, uh, not only in the hands of our adversaries, but in the general public who, yeah. you know, in cases just uh, being foolish or, or not knowing the rules accidentally, you know, we have this incident in Colorado where uh, the war zones covered it, uh, D. Johnson uh, has covered it. Um, 
and they still don't know where all of these, you know, drones that seem to, uh, you know, and, and it happened in Arizona. And it's actually, it was a story I wrote a couple years ago. It was happening throughout you for seemingly, you know, flying over nuclear facilities uh, and power plants. And people are concerned, uh, you know, in Europe, their major concern is what if these were terrorists? You know, they could cause major problems. Um, and so that seems to be something that would be quite a tax to track all of that and to understand, you know, Whose drones these are? Are there theirs? Are there ours? Not only is it a, a, a difficult task to keep track of all of them, but it seems to be vital um, to security to do this. I think that this is a massive issue. I think um, Johnson and then the war zones coverage of it has been essential and alarming. Um, I think it's actually something we should all be paying more attention to. Um, I forget the the exact number of cases. I think it's on the order of about fifty um, that, that Johnson found in his reporting. Uh, and only five had been resolved. Um, these were specifically reactor um, cases of, of things flying over reactors that weren't identified. That's a major, major problem. Someone asked earlier, you know, what do I write about? Um, actually, I write quite a bit uh, about the, the security issues um, involved in that particular bit of reporting in my most recent piece. Um, you know, as far as, you know, sensitivities to talking about drones, I think there's an understandable sensitivity in the UFO community due to years of, you know, neglect and taboo and stigma and all of that, that anything that isn't dealing with the most difficult cases is deflection um, or some kind of flavor of ridicule. And I get that sensitivity, uh, of course. But on the other hand, I think just realistically, we've got to realize that, again, in that pile of unknown cases, it's just the way it works that most of them are going to be misidentification. Some of them are going to be drones. And, you know, and a few are these really spectacular cases that everyone gets excited about. And I, I think it's important to get to not get too, too exercised about that. What that when, you know, unsurprisingly, we find one case, sure, is, is, a, is a misidentification or a drone that doesn't throw everything out. You know, you have to work each case individually. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that's another point I made recently is that resolving one case does not resolve all of them simultaneously. Um, so I, I, I just want to make that point that if you hear me talking about drones, it's not to reduce or to eliminate the strange cases, but rather to just kind of deal with the data that we have in front of us. Mm -hmm. Which I think is going to be a learning curve for the general public is if we start to hear a lot of stories about drones and, and investigation of drones in this UAP task force, which seems appropriate, uh, and uh, that, that doesn't necessarily... Uh, and I, I can see the headlines now, you know, it turns out UFOs are all drones. Um, you know, that won't be the case necessarily, even if we do. And we should be prepared that we may hear a lot of type of things from this this group. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? In that, that what we're right. trying to do is solve, you know, unidentified cases. And I think it's it's actually really important to know when it's a drone. I mean, you, for someone who's had a strange sighting, I'm sure you don't want to walk around thinking it's you know, it, it was this, this um, profound thing. And then it turns out to be a drone. You want to know the truth, whatever, whatever that truth is. Um, but then on the other hand, I understand there, there are plenty of people that say everything is a drone, right? Everything that's strange, it somehow must be a drone. It's like the replacement for, for the UFO in some respect. Um, and that's, um, you know, that, that doesn't pass muster either. And again, it gets back to this, this problem of nuance that I, I think is really important. Um, and I think the more nuanced, anyone can be with an interest in this field, the, the better, because it's already charged with, you know, so much history and emotion and everything. Mm -hmm. The other uh, topic I wanted to bring up, which I know is very curious for you, and it was for me as well, is uh, that latest New York Times article that kind of brought into the mix uh, UFO crashes, um, which was kind of strange, um, a strange in many fronts, I'm, I'm not even sure it, my only guess as to why that even happened was to kind of placate perhaps that, that side of the UFO community that wants to know more about Roswell and some of these other things. Um, but the problem was it kind of introduced, um, some very speculative, uh, and, uh, kind of, you know, essentially hearsay at second, third hand source type of information, whereas so far we had been working with some very good, you know, credible information and data, you know, firsthand witnesses like 
like jet fighter pilots. That seemed to be kind of strange. Yeah, it was certainly a departure from the previous stories. And I, I you know, I want to be careful and respectful of the times, respectful of the reporters. I know they're, they're professionals and, you know, um, they, and they're invested in these stories clearly. Um, I, I think, yeah, there were a few issues. There were the obvious things that I think we all talked about. So some of them were the decision to paraphrase rather than to quote. Um, and, um, you know, th those things I think proved to be probably the most conspicuous. There, there were other issues there. So th to kind of rewind in our conversation earlier about Blue Book versus 9-11 as a model, the 9-11 um, report. If you, the mistake there about having a report every six months instead of in six months is actually a little bit more significant. So it's, it's a missed opportunity there to recognize that the idea isn't we're going to have, you know, a rolling update on how things are going in the world of UFOs, but rather that there's going to be this intensive, not necessarily whole of government, but the whole of the IC and national security apparatus really working on this thing for a short period to find where the problems are and then aggressively attack it. Um, it's just a different, uh, a different animal uh, than I think that it was characterized there. And that may seem like a small mistake, you know, to the casual reader, uh, reader you know, they said every, uh, you know, uh, twice a year, you know, repeating report instead of once. Well, when you unpack it, there, there's quite a bit more there. Um, I think that the other thing that stood out to me, just from a perspective of science reporting, uh, is that it's always good to have a expert uh, in a field who is not necessarily directly involved in the work at hand to, to comment. Um, that's something that uh, journalists often get wrong with science coverage is that they go and they talk to someone who discovered something and they get their particular take on it. And of course that person, you know, is, is really excited by their discovery and they, they have a reason they wanna talk it up. So you need to talk to other experts in the field. And this is actually where I have a ton of sympathy for them as reporters, because how do you do that here, right? There, there, there's a level of secrecy where it's difficult to go and get some, you know, materials uh, science engineer or, um, you know, a material science um, person to, to comment, uh, but I, you know, I, I think that that kind of effort to to balance a little bit more would have been helpful um, because in scientific efforts, it really never comes down to, you know, one person say so. I think there's a little bit of that idea that it's just one person who's the expert. It, it really rarely works that way. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. It was a departure. It was striking when it came out. I think it surprised a lot of people. It certainly surprised me. Um and it's, it'll be it'll be really interesting to see where it goes from here. Mm -hmm. The way Chris Mellon framed it is uh, that it it provided in those briefings uh, leads for the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, which kind of uh, essentially for the this report that uh, should be coming out at some point because um, it does seem like you know they are moving forward with all of this. But, uh, that will be. The Court, which should have all of the historic, at least publicly consumable, uh, what we'll see, historic information regarding uh, potential of, of materials. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, I mean, if if there are materials, then let's examine them, right? And, you know, who knows what they are? Uh, but certainly if, and we're talking about uh, Dr. Eric Davis here um, in a roundabout way, if, if Davis had um, Dr. Davis had examined these things and, and found them to be interesting, then clearly at some point uh, along the way, they had them in, in their custody and they were able to do some sort of work on them. So it should be possible to do that again. Um, so I'm, I'm all for, if they think they found something that has odd properties, of course, you know, let's look at it. Um, but I think with something with such a heavy um, kind of charge behind it, it would be wise to do that work in advance and report on it rather than to kind of anticipate what you know, what the report might say. Um, hmm. yeah. Right. And I think I, and then I kind of asked these questions too, and it get, kind of does relate to blue book somewhat in that um, the idea of transparency, will this work? Will this be as transparent as hoped? Uh, will the UAP task force be as transparent? Um, you know, I wrote up recently kind of the problem with the DOD uh, public affairs, office and, and the responses they've given us thus far, the, the Pentagon Project, ATIP, and uh, have these today that perhaps there will be more information that the 
is along the lines of some of the things that uh, have demonstrably been wrong that they've said in the past. Um, if that continues, or if that happens, let's say in the next few days, um, it doesn't bode for the type of, I guess, relationship that this organization might have with the public in the future. Yeah, that's that's a, a, a question worth asking is is how the public relation aspect of this will work. I mean, as I said previously, I think it, just judging by the draft language um, before we you know saw what the, the Senate Intel Committee ultimately produced, it really, I think, was designed as an intergovernmental process primarily. So it lets fix the problem on the inside and, you know, get things working as it should. And then along the way, you know, we're going to try to do what we can for public confidence. Um, I think because of all the things we mentioned at the, the start of our conversation, all the, the tripwires you run into in talking about this. So it, it may be the case that realistically the, the, the you know, the, the public perception of it is not the top priority. You know, national security is. Um, and that's, that's hard for, for all of us watching this issue and caring about it. Because, of course, we want to be informed. And like I said, there's a good reason why we need to be informed, actually. Um, but nevertheless, they're going to have to balance, you know, this equation. Um, and, uh, you know, some parts of that may be less than satisfying for us. Right. And you know, well, it's been the, kind of the theme of the conversation. But at the same time, you know, uh, they have real world issues to, you know, some very important national security issues to tend with here and to, um, so, you know, arguably should be consideration, uh, ultimately or primarily anyway, uh, even if it does disappoint some of us in the outside who want to know more. Yeah. So one of the things that I've written about uh, that's kind of on the opposite of this, because we've been saying, well, there might be a need to kind of keep the information limited and, you know, it may be very quiet and so on. I mean, arguably, there could be a reverse dynamic down the road. So let's say that um, Christopher Mellon's basically right, you know, that there's been bureaucratic intransigence, the, the issue just hasn't been dealt with, and that some of these really strange cases are exotic, whatever that might mean. Um, and there is a recognition of that at some point. Um, and, it, and it does become, at least in some measure, public. Well, you, you know, you're looking at very constrained options at that point, because if you then decide not to investigate, not to communicate about it, um, you're, you're essentially playing right into the conspiracy and, and kind of cover up ideas that I don't think will be tolerable at that point in time. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have now this acute question of what to do about it. Um, and that is a really serious and, and hard problem. I mean, as, as far as we know, in all of the strange uh, reports, these things are pretty evasive. They, they don't seem like they're particularly interested in having any kind of an, ex uh, of an exchange. We don't, can't predict when uh, or where they're going to be. So even if we can admit it, what do we do? What do we actually do you know, in, in the weeks or months after, say, you know, Mellon has, has proven to be correct about this? It's a real dilemma. Um, and, and it opens up all kinds of problems um, in terms of the way that the public might react to that news um, and, and what information we may have available to us at that point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as much as it sounds like this is all kind of boring national security, the reality on the other side is, you know, there, there could be some really, I mean, it's, it sort of feels, at least from my vantage, I'm newer to this, I'm newer to these ideas. It's head spinning, you know, to, to, to think about those sorts of things and to write about. Right. And that's, I think, where the challenge is. And I guess uh, what's interesting about this conversation, because, you know, putting yourself in their shoes, uh, and of course, I'm always thinking about the PR side of things. How do you communicate with the public on this issue? That's a really difficult topic, especially when you're contending with national security, uh, you know, classified information, uh, you know, counterintelligence. It it's really difficult um, to do that, and and especially with fear. Government has we do have a few indications where they've kind of encouraged the idea of uh, UFOs to cover up uh, projects. You know, we've heard this with the Oxcart program, YouTube program, uh, stuff out of Area Fifty. It's okay to believe they're UFOs. Um, the, uh, that's it, it, 
really, I don't know how they're to deal, deal with. Yeah, we've got a little bit of a delay here, so hopefully I um, I caught you. Yes, I mean, th this is a really hard problem. I, I sort of suspect that um, there may be a situation where they have a great deal of data, meaning they have more videos, they've got radar, they've got whatever other capabilities they have, but they may not necessarily have more information. So what I mean by that is for all of those videos and all of that data, it, it may be hard to kind of make heads or tails of, of what's in them. In other words, they may be just about as perplexed as the rest of us. So then if that is the case, then how do you communicate that to the public, that, that really the secret is a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding of what you're dealing with? Um, mm -hmm. particularly from institutions that are charged with, you know, definitively no, not just knowing what's going on, but, but defending us against, um, you know, whatever, uh, things may be out there. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's why I say where it's, it's dizzying to think about the, the way this chessboard looks, if you're the person in charge of national security, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that, you know, a model might be SETI or at least the SETI Institute scientific a very something that used to be seen as fringe not much anymore now astrobiology the the name even with nasa so perhaps you know something like that can of it where there are things seen that what there's a group of scientists you know working diligently to figure it out yeah i think SETI is something that um is certainly important i think also it's, it's underappreciated but there's um a parallel effort called METI of, of messaging extraterrestrial intelligence so scientists that think about how could you make a comprehensible message to another species that doesn't perhaps share anything really with you in common um you know and and again you know this is a bit speculative but if there is something you know really truly strange out there then we may be confronted with that problem of how exactly mm -hmm. do you communicate? How do you do that in practice? It's actually a very specific technical problem. <laughs> it's not as easy as just sort of waving out the window, right? So, um, and and there, there are really fascinating debates within that community. So there tend to be many scholars who are anthropologists and historians and people with humanities backgrounds. And then there are, you know, physicists and computer scientists. And the physicists and computer scientists at, at generally tend to be on the side of we can build up communication through mathematics and we can actually communicate very complex things in that way. And many of the anthropologists and linguists and so on are skeptical of that. And they say, sure, you know, you can show that you're intelligent, but how do you go from mathematics to being able to talk meaningfully about society or culture or ethics or, you know, many of the things that, you know, we might want to communicate about. So those are very real, you know, uh, live debates in that community and something probably the public hasn't really looked at much. But, you know, boy, that could be very, very relevant, <laughs> um, you know, d depending how how these efforts go. Another difficult policy along these lines seem to be not necessarily policy, but seems to be unwritten. Um, and he uh, has talked about this when he worked at the Ministry of Defense, working at the UFO desk, how they would use spin and dirty and other words where if they're asked about a UFO case, they make a joke of it. Um, and then the media runs with that and then does look more deeply into their uh, what they're acting, which is taking some of the issues seriously. I think certainly you can see a parallel in the way that we've dealt with it uh, here in the United States. Perhaps, you know, looking, uh, especially when I wrote my latest that article, you know, looking at the 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 DOD has responded to Elizondo came coming out and exposing a tip. Uh, it seems that kind of is the rule, um, and it seems like it's, it's nature to do that. And are we be able to have a credible shift from that sort of uh, response to you know a more open, transparent? Um, hey, you know, your friend, we're your partner in looking into all of this. Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're seeing that sort of transition now, you know, and I, I think that's what many are trying to do. And so, you know, I, I credit very much journalists like Tim McMillan and MJ Benias and so many others for um, giving this, you know, serious um, coverage and and not not you know treating it as um, kind of the wacky story of the week or whatever as it often gets you know characterized as, unfortunately. 
Um, and I think, you know, the media history is really, really interesting. So a piece I wrote a while back now was about the history of the Rendlesham Forest incident uh, and the way that that was handled in the press. And so um, in brief, uh, so ufologists, that was actually an international team of ufologists, from what I understand, uh, worked through FOIA you know, and other means to, to develop that case and were quite successful. They, they, they got documents um, sort of in hand. And then when they... Uh, went to their colleagues in the press to get it to get the get, get the story out. Uh, they went to a newspaper that had a huge amount of circulation, but was kind of known for more salacious types of stories. They were able to break real news, but they they focused on the more kind of exciting side. Well, that newspaper chose to write it up in the most exciting possible version, but maybe not the the best supported by the facts. And so they got it's a classic case in journalism of getting out over your skis. And so predictably, what happened was all the other papers knocked the story down um, because they didn't want to see that they'd been scooped on this major thing. Um, and it made the story, the story look silly very quickly. And then the general sense was, well, there's nothing to it, right? And then, then the case died. Um, we know from the kind, uh, Condine documents, the UK's effort to look at these issues years later, there was some reason to, to think that those events were significant. Um, so this pattern, you know, plays out over and over that there's an appetite in the public for the more exciting aspects of these stories. And that appetite can actually be destructive to the topic because it can, it can lead you to, again, telling that most exciting version rather than kind of the conservative, um, but best factually supported version. So, mm -hmm. um, part of the answer to that is that journalists need to be careful. We need to know that tendency and to have it in mind. Um, I think that learning from history basically is the, the best answer I can think of at the moment to, you know, to your question of how we deal with this. Yeah. Third, uh, you know, you wrote an article that brought up another great point and uh, which I think, you know, more to it now, since you've written the article, is the Air Force, all of this, um, you know, when it came to previous UFO research projects, they were headed by the Air Force. Um, the Air Force has always been kind of the go-to on this topic but they've been practically nowhere to be found. They did a, you know, there was Tim McMillan, you know, that article about how uh, the Air Force did investigate those videos. That's about all that we've heard from them. And the ONI, the Navy intelligence, is in charge of all of this. That seems pretty strange as well. It does. It does. I mean, that that is kind of one of the central policy mysteries here is why is the, you know, the, the military branch that's uh, whose mission it is to defend the skies not more involved, you know, in, in these in this particular set of issues. Um, yeah, it is. It is a it is a fascinating question. Um, so one of the things I wrote about, one, one of the surprising things, if you compare the language that, um, that, that Mellon drafted and, and put out publicly, and then what's in the actual Senate Intel report, uh, is that the Senate Intel report's timeline is far more aggressive. It's, it's a if I recall correctly, it's a third as long as, as what Mellon had suggested. And one, I, so that it raises the question, right, of why, why that fast? Um, surely it would take more time to do the job. And um, I kind of lay out that if the problem you're trying to solve is bureaucratic intransigence, one solution to that might be you give an almost impossible to meet deadline that they're going to have to work really, really quickly uh, to fulfill because it will exactly show you who's moving slowly. Uh, when eventually the director of, of national intelligence, the DNI, is, is sitting in the chair before the Senate, um, that person is going to have to have an answer uh, they're going to have to be able to support it. And if they're asked, you know, why couldn't you get better answers? They're going to need to identify someone. Um, and the argument that I made is that the Air Force is at a high risk of, of being that entity that gets uh, designated as the slow party. And they don't want to do that. And uh, they don't have to do that. They're, I think they actually have an opportunity, if they'd like, uh, to, to be more active. I think they can use this issue to showcase their incredible uh, technological ability there's new leadership in the Air Force right now, so it's good timing from that perspective. And I think that on the other hand, if it doesn't, if it doesn't rise to the moment, it it has the risk of ceding leadership to the Navy, uh, which is not great <laughs> along any number of dimensions in terms of budgets, but also just to the imagination of future recruits. Do you really want to leave this really interesting area to another branch? Because that young person that's interested in science and technology, they're going to want to go to the Navy. Um, because that's where the interesting things are happening, you know, not the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So 
um, I, I, I hope they realize that they have an opportunity, uh, also a risk, and that they they really grab the issue. Another gamble they all have to make is to kind of gauge public interest also. Uh, some have argued that perhaps the DOD, uh, you know, miss, miss that, that they had felt there wasn't enough public interest that this would go, uh, you know, very far. And that's why they made these dubious claims to begin with. They just thought, you know, business as usual, spinning dirty tricks. We give them an answer. They write their stories and they go away. It's a story that hasn't gone away. And uh, that could be sort of, you know, gamble that they might be thinking right now. Maybe the Air Force is thinking, well, once a report comes out, they might highlight us as one of the problematic organizations who isn't Paul. But so, are they really going to push us on it? Right. I, well, to that, I would say, you know, what percentage of scientists and engineers that you know are fans of science fiction and, and are interested <laughs> in, you know, all of these kinds of issues, right? It's a very high percentage. Um, and those people are plenty mature enough to realize that, you know, fiction is fiction, but, you know, there are these strange cases that we can't resolve. I mean, that's, that's the other thing. So put, we can even put the fictions part and the popular culture part of it aside, just a mystery, just a scientific mystery. That is precisely what, what gets scientists and engineers out of bed in the morning is to solve those kinds of things. So I, I would say that that would be a, a pretty profound, you know, miscalculation to think that the, the public just doesn't care or it's just a small group of people. Uh, boy, just look at movies recently and I think you'll see a whole lot of people are, are very interested. Right. And I would agree. And, and you know, and, and it becomes interesting, though, uh, you know, the role that the election plays in this. I mean, uh, has that come up with uh, Biden or Kamala, uh, who comes to the Senate Intelligence Committee? You know, are people behind the scenes? This might be a Brian Bender question because he insight in this arena. Uh, Brian Benner being the Politico uh, writer who was defense and space editor for Politico when he started writing this. Now he's a senior correspondent. But, uh, you know, what is her type for all of this? Is she on board in this, you know, putting, you know, getting this information? Uh, you know, even the DNI changes, if it changes, yeah. uh, if the administration changes. Oh, there's so many there's so many factors to look at there. But before I go into them, let me say, let's get some panel discussions going at some point, because it would be really interesting to hear what what someone like Brian Bender would have to say on a question like this. But um, but yeah, absolutely. So the, the question of who the you know particular DNI is and, and who the people are in these positions um, is massively impactful in, in terms of what life experience they bring to that job. Also, just the the issues and the agenda that they're going to be working on as they go into that job. How much attention are they going to have? You know, it's important to remember we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of serious questions about election security, um, among so many others. So all of that is going to play a role. The, the world doesn't stop for, for UFOs, unfortunately. Um, yes, and some people have raised the question of uh, would Harris um, in particular, you know, be more aware of this because she you know, sat on the Intel Committee? Uh, maybe, yeah, I think is a good answer to that. Probably she would be involved. But, but of course, like staff tends to really be where a lot of the, you know, the nitty gritty work get, gets done. So, you know, if you're relying on her personally, having an intimate knowledge of all of that may or may not be the case. So I don't think there's any way to say, but to me, you know, another question is, um, you know, after the election, that committee is still going to be there. And, and if they, if uh, the Biden Harris tickets uh, wins, um, well, those are going to be her former colleagues. And so if they run into trouble at any point and they need some help from the executive branch, you know, those relationships may be significant. Um, so there are all those kinds of factors too, that are, that are hard to weigh precisely, but, you know, often are very impactful in government. So it, mm -hmm. yes, it will, it will absolutely have a role. And I, I think if there's a turnover in administration, you know, there are many positions that will, will likely quickly change and, and that will just inevitably change some of the, um, tone and tenor, um, you know, of how this work gets done. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point, um, that at least that, that will exist, that connection, um, that they will have, you know, that leverage by having one of their one of their own in the White House if that happens. Absolutely. Yeah, they both have unusual um, uh, foreign relations and intelligence backgrounds. Um, that that much is for sure. So I think you could expect that they're going to have a lot on their plate if if they win. Of course, I mean, who knows? 
but national security issues are going to be are going to be huge, basically, no matter who wins the election. Mm -hmm. I, and, you know, other questions bringing up uh, Brian that that he, you know, has kind of been tackling is especially lately kind of this idea uh, and we might have brought it up earlier um, that really kind of some of this history that's going on is a bit um, under the bridge that really right now the big questions are what is this task force going to do um, you know what is this report going to look like sort of the questions that we've been talking about earlier rather than kind of getting caught up in the details behind what happened in the past with with a tip or or you know some of these questions of you know when did this change what was the name who was doing what sort of thing yeah, absolutely. I think there there are um, so many issues prospectively, you know, looking forward that, that we ought to have an eye on exactly who goes into these positions, the backgrounds they bring, um, all of those things. I, I understand that the, the historical questions are important and that they have an important bearing. But I do um, a, a agree with uh, Brian Bender, you know, fa fairly strongly that um, that some of those things are, they're, while interesting, are perhaps less important than than where we go from here. Mm hmm. So, I mean, um, your overall thought, I guess, uh, where should people be looking right now in your mind? Uh, with respect to policy, you know, to with respect to policy and where it's all headed. I mean, if you were to kind of meter people's expectations, um, how would that happen? Boy, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think in general, and maybe this reveals uh, bias on my part, I would always say meter your expectations in this field, right? Like there, the, this is also a field that's known to have recurring moments of a feeling of disclosure is imminent, you know, things are really going to change any day. And then it, it usually is not the case. That said, I do think we are in a departure from that. I mean, I think longtime observers will, will know this better than I do as being in relatively short term. Uh, but it, it, things are changing here. And, and exactly what it's changing is at the policy level. It's that um, someone like a, a figure like, you know, Christopher Mellon with his, uh, you know, uh, really deep background has, has tackled this, has thought through a strategy to, to get the legislative branch to take it seriously, um, and, and further has thought about a strategy to kind of compel parts of the executive branch that normally don't want to deal with this to deal with this. Wow, that's, that is a heck of a story. Um, so I think that is the part that I would look to. Uh, I would look to the government aspects. Um, and if, if I had any advice for, for people, I guess it would be to also read outside of ufology too, particularly if you're really focused on, on the small details within kind of ufological circles. You know, make sure you're keeping an eye on foreign policy and other things writ large and, and reading some history and things in there too for, for measure because, you know, all those other issues aren't going to go away. Um, if, if let's say there's a stunning breakthrough and the, you know, the UAP task force says, yes, proof positive, we've got extraterrestri extraterrestrials visiting us. Well, we still have a pandemic. We still have national divisions. We still have domestic divisions. Um, we have all of these things. And someone who's in the policy chair has got, they don't have the luxury to just solve one thing. They've got to deal with all of that all at once. Um, and it's, it's a really complicated stew. So if, if you think it's going to be simple, it's not. <laughs> so you know, read up on the part that you don't usually read up on, I suppose would be my overall advice. Mm -hmm. And my other question, I guess, getting kind of also into latest news is we also have kind of, you've mentioned Chris Mellon a lot. Nick Chris Mellon gets his way. And I think you're crediting him a lot with the, with the kind of the strategy uh, behind all of this. And I agree with you. Um, uh, he does seem to be the mastermind. I mean, he was, he's definitely familiar with uh, with all of these organizations uh, and how the Hill works, uh, how the Senate Intelligence Committee works, and he kind of admitted that to me a bit. In my my interview with him um, that there was this grand plan that seems to be coming to fruition, and Elizondo has said, you know, it's coming to, together much more quickly than we expected. But it's also a bit of a handoff in that, uh, you know, it was Elizondo that exposed that the Pentagon program. Uh, was there 
then, you know, he joins to the stars in this group of people, including Mellon, who then move forward with this in order to get the Senate uh, to pay attention and get the Senate Intelligence Committee to ask these questions, which they, which they have. Now this UAP task force has been formally announced. What role does to the stars really have anymore? It seems that, you know, now that they've handed this off or gotten what they wanted, um, are there even necessary and is there even a role for them in all of this? Oh, I think there I think there is for sure. I, I, I think that at a at a bare minimum as a kind of watchdog of the process, because, you know, remember that this this the Senate provision is passed, but, um, you know, the, the legislation as a whole has not. And the, the other really important thing is that there's a long history of the legislative branch making a request for something and then the executive branch stonewalling or just sort of not really implementing it, the, you know, the way that it's been asked for. So there is a lot of work to do, I, I would imagine, behind the scenes to make sure um, that all of these parties that normally don't want to uh, cooperate with each other are cooperating. Um, and someone like um, Chris Mellon, who I guess we should say, you know, had was uh, under Secretary of Defense, but also a, a senior uh, staff member in the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, you know, he, he acutely knows that that landscape, I'm, I'm sure, and, and knows that uh, getting these agencies to work together is going to be no easy task. So mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a lot to be done there. Uh, it gets back to what we're talking about with monolithic government, right? The, these these agencies don't always play nice with each other. Um, so a lot to watch I, out for. Right. I had to take myself off the screen to sneeze there for a moment, but uh, that's where I went. <laughs> But, uh, you know, along those lines, because I think it, it's just going to be to the stars role to play as a watchdog, but kind of all of our role. Um, but of course, that's kind of where we've been. And there are that that large amount. I always say this, that a lot of, you know, kind of populist sort of uh, UFO efforts turn into alien disclosure groups, you know, disclose that you're dealing with or working with or, you know, there's aliens. Um I, I feel that that's kind of a definitely a tenuous position because I don't feel that we have uh, evidence strong enough to kind of go there really. But um, for those who are serious like yourself or other others who are getting into this and seeing that, you know, there's a lot of legitimate uh, information to the idea that there's more of a myth to some of these cases. Uh, how would you recommend people go about that? I mean, what's a responsible, effective way to be a watchdog? Well, um, following the relevant legislation helps. Um, so being aware of exactly what's in there, you know, make sure that you're not just looking at the second and third order coverage of it, um, you know, in tweets and so on. Read the primary document, so to speak. Um, and you can do all the things that, um, that, that, you know, that we do in politics of writing letters, um, you know, talking to your representatives. When you write those letters, I, I would encourage people to be simple and straightforward and to emphasize the importance of taking it seriously and to be, well, actually I'll, I'll sort of steal a little bit of a line from, from Elizondo and the TTSA crew um, of be aware of what you believe, you know, what you think and what you know. And really, I would say in your advocacy, stick with what you know. Um, that's that's gonna take you a lot further than than what you may, you know, think or, or believe is the case. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I, essentially that's it. I mean, I think staying involved in the public discourse, you know, um, speaking your mind, um, following the news, uh, being careful and, and critical in your information sources is always an important thing in this field. Um, all of that, that, that would be my advice. Mm -hmm. And you know what, you've been a great help in that. And I would recommend definitely people checking out your blog and watching your blog for your articles. Uh, I intend to, and I hope you will join us again for, for uh, to come up as we watch this all kind of come to, come to, come to fruition. Um, and then, yes, you know, you've got a great idea and that is something I plan to do is more panels around some of these topics. So we can all talk to, to kind of figure some of this out as well, yeah. because all of these people you're mentioning, all these journalists that we've brought up or, or researchers all have kind of a different piece of the puzzle and are getting information um, from different sources. So it does help to come together and share information, so get a clearer view of what's going on. 
Yeah, and I'll just say, I mean, I, I suspect we're coming to a conclusion here, but I, I just want to say that some of the researchers and, and people in this community have been some of the absolute best I, I've encountered in any field. Incredibly generous with their time, um, you know, incredibly helpful and, and sharing. Um, so they're, they're really, as much as the community sometimes gets maligned a bit, you know, it'd be, at least among the community researchers, there, there's some, some real gems. Um, so this is, um, this is a, actually a great space to be working in. Um, yeah, and I, I look I look forward to future conversations. Well, and I guess I'll ask, you know, because I, I think you've stated this was your first uh, interview on this topic. Now that we're kind of wrapping it up, uh, how'd it go? It was it was easy, huh? It wasn't too bad. I, yeah, hopefully <laughs> the, the audience will ultimately be the ones to judge how it went. But uh, but yes, I, I uh, this was a good first interview experience, and I'm very glad we're done. <laughs> Good. And uh, and even if the audience doesn't appreciate it, which I'm sure they will, uh, especially my audience, I greatly, greatly appreciate it and found it very insightful, just as I knew it would be. All right. Anytime. Anytime. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, for those of you who were watching live, uh, just so you know, this link, this video will uh, change to only be viewable by YouTube members. Uh, however, if you're a Patreon member, I do upload a special Patreon video that I'll get up uh, later today, very soon. Um, so you'll have your own video that you can watch in, uh, for good as well. So uh, you'll all be taken care of. And for those pod people, the audio listeners on Patreon, I'll also have an audio version up very soon as well. But uh, thank you so much for joining, Adam. Again, I'll bring it up again so people can see. Uh, the website is uh, blog.adamkehoe, as we covered before, not uh, in relation not to Donald. the Donald Kehoe. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that you'll be able to read all of the articles. So, uh, and how soon is your next article coming out? Uh, I'm going to pass on that one. Um, so there's a couple okay. of things, a couple of things in the works. Uh, like I said, I'm very excited to be working with Tim McMillan and, um, and yeah, well, you'll be among the first to know, I'm sure. Just as a quick note too, strategicdoubt.com should work, should take you to the blog as well. Oh, okay, great. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and, uh, until next time. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Have a good one. Yeah.